This week we're going to look at educational technology policies as they relate to being a teacher of digital technologies. Now there's a wide range of policies that you need to be aware of as a teacher. Um, when you first begin teaching and when you go out onto your practicums, you will be presented with the range of policies to which you need to be familiar with and to adhere to as a teacher. Now, these represent many dozens of policies of many hundreds of pages. Um, and of course, you're not going to be familiar with them all straight away. But over time, you do need to make sure that you become very familiar with the policies that you need to work within. And there will be some training provided to prepare you for that, but a lot of it you need to do yourself to make sure that you are within the boundaries of those policies as part of your employment. So the first policy we're going to look at is acceptable use policies. Now, generally every school, university, and most large organizations now have some form of policy around what is acceptable or not, particularly with the use of digital technologies. Now, there'll also be behavior management policies and other um, policies within your organization, but we're gonna focus on the ones that relate more specifically to digital technologies. And the acceptable use policies are certainly one of those. In the main, they are designed to um, reduce opportunities for litigation against schools. Uh, schools need to make sure that they are setting boundaries for students and staff to work within when use of digital technologies and the internet and other associated tools. And so these set the boundaries of what's um, acceptable. Now, generally, they will be developed by the school's IT manager um, or if in a departmental school, it'll be developed by the department and they will frame what is acceptable use of different technologies. Now, you need to be very careful around this because, well, for students, sometimes it extends to the use of these technologies at home. It doesn't normally extend so far for teachers but it certainly can be a problem if you bring your own personal digital devices onto a school campus where those devices may be um, have material on them or be in the process of accessing various materials that breach the acceptable use policies and many students and teachers have been caught out by that um, for example you may have been downloading a song or a movie um, which is sort of okay at home sometimes uh, but if you then start continuing to download that once you are on a school campus and that's fairly easily flagged by the school servers and so forth then that is a very clear breach of the acceptable use policies and consequences would then flow from that so you do need to be careful about your use of technologies um, particularly in that boundary between home use and school use. Now, other things involve, or other things have changed over the years. For example, now there's a number of schools that are producing their own digital textbooks. And teachers are expected to produce digital textbooks as part of their teaching. Here in the Gold Coast, St. Hilda's is a private girls' school in Southport, and it has that requirement on teachers. Now, that opens up a whole range of new acceptable uses and processes that are in place in that environment that may not be the same in other schools and um, educational environments. So one thing you need to do when you go out onto placement or when you're applying for a job in a school or when you have a job in a school is to make sure you um, look up what is acceptable in terms of practice in that school. And we're going to talk about how those different acceptances can impact upon what you do in the classroom a little bit later. So one of the key framings of acceptable use policies has been around cyber safety um, to make sure that students and staff are protected from nefarious activities and breaches of privacy and a whole range of other aspects related to cyber safety. Now, 
cyber safety issues don't happen all that often, but when they do, they often make the media because they are um, extraordinary events to a large extent. And of course, that can then have an impact upon um, various levels in a school. Uh, if it reaches a minister's ear, then they can call for a ministerial inquiry um, and that will then flow back down through the system quite rapidly and end up on the teachers or the students involved um, quite heavily. So we do need to be aware of cyber safety and a large part of the digital technologies curriculum has been framed around informing students about appropriate um, behavior online. And that's going to continue with the latest revisions of the digital technologies curriculum. Because um, that's one of the biggest concerns. It's not a hugely uh, big educational concern. These things change all the time and it's got some issues around networks and so forth that it's important for students to learn. But in the main, it's much more of a social issue. And digital technologies has the responsibility within the curriculum to address that. Now, the ICT general capabilities are also meant to address it, which means everyone is meant to address it, but it tends to fall within the digital technologies realm quite specifically. Um, now, on the course website, I've provided you with a set of acceptable use policies uh, for both the um, Department of Education in Queensland uh, policies and also some private school policies so that you can have a look at those and see the range of things that are addressed as part of acceptable use policies and in particular how they address cyber safety. In the main, cyber safety addresses two key areas, um, how to use technology responsibly and appropriately and how to behave in ways that enhance the student's own safety when they're using these technologies. Now in Queensland, the main focus has been around identity management and making sure that the students um, are not, uh, their identity is not revealed when they're using digital technologies, particularly online digital technologies. Now that has a whole lot of issues, particularly around um, estranged parents, um, where they don't necessarily have visitation rights or access rights to children and utilize schools to track down where those children are. Um, so there's a lot of privacy concerns around identifying students, down to not allowing student photos to be published online and things of that nature. So that's the main focus in Queensland. Um, throughout Australia, um, cyberbullying and the downloading of illegal content and abusive images is one of the key focuses. So one challenge you're going to have as a teacher, indeed, including as a pre-service teacher, is the restrictions that are placed on software and internet sites that you're allowed to utilize with your students. Now, these are quite restrictive and have been in place for many, many years now, particularly in Education Queensland schools. Um, there's a lot of restrictions placed there. Uh, and essentially anything that has any data that is captured about students and stored externally, um, that includes their name or their email address and things of that nature, is generally restricted. So all the Google tools, for example, are restricted and can't be used in Education Queensland schools. Um, Microsoft, of course Microsoft is the main platform used in Education Queensland schools, does have an exemption because they set up an Australian um, server to um, and so that's sort of the exemption that's allowed but in the main if it's a tool that relies upon students identifying themselves in order to be able to log on and use that service and most of them have that um, then it's not allowed there is a white list of allowable tools but generally they don't have any authentication process um, and are quite dated in terms of their functionality. So the key thing is that when you go out onto placement, don't assume that the 
technology or, or a website or a tool that you planned on using will be accessible when you are in the classroom. Now that said, there are mechanisms in place to request um, these sites and resources to be unblocked um, and there are processes that can be gone through to do that but they can take um, a couple of weeks in order to achieve and so that makes it a little bit problematic when you're on short placements. So these are some of the things that are approved in terms of um, access via an Education Queensland network, um, games, email, um, military sites, news and media sites and so forth, including um, sex education and things of that nature. So there's a reasonable amount of stuff that is accessible, but it's when we get to the things that have been blocked, that's when it becomes challenging. So for example, file storage and sharing. So shared uh, file storage online is not permitted, um, as is any peer-to-peer -peer services, but also things such as internet telephony or anything that involves communication between others online. Now this is a big challenge for digital technologies because part of the curriculum as we explored last week was that students need to be able to work in groups and collaborate both locally and internationally. Now communication tools are fantastic for doing that via the internet but unfortunately many of them are not permitted in some of our schools. In many of the independent schools they are permitted. So other aspects such as social networking, um, web analytics, piracy and copyright sites, again problematic when we're actually teaching about those issues, um, media sharing, um, and where's the big one? Um, uh, computer and information security. So anything to do with um, IT security is restricted in terms of access, which makes it problematic for um, our courses, which are teaching about these things. Likewise, web hosting is not permitted. Um, and so teaching about how to run a web server and administer a web server becomes another challenge. We will talk about some ways around these and other alternatives to doing these things later on in the course. But just to make you aware that there are challenges. And even though you may have found some great tools that then students could download and use, downloading of software is not permitted. Um, so again, these things will hopefully change over time. Obviously, there are some things that we do want to keep restricted. Child pornography and things of that nature, of course, will always be restricted. But there are certainly other things that we would like to be able to engage with students in terms of teaching them about that, which are currently um, locked down. Now, another issue that you're going to need to become familiar with is the concept of copyright. Now, it's a complex issue for education and it, it changes quite often, um, particularly here in Australia, and we're trying to get it changed even more. In the United States, they have a concept called um, fair dealing. Uh, and I think it's fair dealing, let me just check. A uh, fair use. Um, while in Australia, we have a concept of fair dealing. Now, fair use assumes that um, teachers can um, use copyrighted material um, in their teaching. We don't have that in Australia. We do for students. Students can use copyrighted material and as long as it's destroyed after they've submitted their assessment and it's no longer needed, they're fine. Um, so you as a student in your courses are fine to um, get uh, material from anywhere you'd like. However, once you graduate, you can't then use that material. Indeed, it should be destroyed because then you would be in breach of copyright. Now, the smart copying website goes through in quite a lot of detail about the issues related to copyright. There is a move to try to have us adopt what's used in America, which is fair use rather than fair dealing, so that teachers generally can use copyrighted material 
course, the reality is teachers do um, and have always used copyrighted material. The challenge has been more recently and why it's become a concern is that it can now be shared online. Now, in the past, everyone knew that teachers were copying um, books and images and comics and video clips and all the rest and using it as part of their lessons. And no one was too concerned because there wasn't any real financial damage to the owners of that copyright as a result. But now that they can be put online and those materials can be copied and used for other purposes and so forth, then there's much more of a focus on ensuring that teachers and schools and so forth don't have as much breaching of copyright as they've been able to do in the past. So fair use would be a fantastic way of addressing that. Um, and it was part of the free trade agreement and so forth, but that was all quashed. Um, and so we didn't get that through, but there's still a lobbying for that. We do still have some basic rights. Um, we can use 10% of a book, 10% of a bit of a sheet, sheet music, an article from a newspaper or journal, um, an image and so forth, as long as they're explicitly being used for the teaching of something. Now, where a lot of people have been getting in trouble is where it's been used for something other than explicitly teaching about a concept, including some of our media organizations. Um, a lot of our news or pseudo news um, shows have been showing YouTube clips and Facebook clips. And as long as they do a critique of that or an examination of that and discuss it from that perspective, that's permitted. But they can't use it for just for humor. And a lot of them have been. And they've been taken to court and found to be in breach of copyright, where they've been showing simply clips for humorous purposes. Um, so these issues are currently happening right now and being worked through. So it's not just education that's facing all these problems, but certainly it's an area that's very important in education because of our use of um, material so much. So the government set up what was called the Copyright Agency in 2019 or a little bit before and it's been going now for it's got an agreement for four years up until uh, 2022 um, whereby it collects money off all the schools and the universities and TAFEs and other educational organizations and as long as they've paid that subscription um, they're turning a blind eye to copyright breaches essentially now that would all go away if we get the fair dealing, uh, fair use rules through. Otherwise, it will need to be renewed on an ongoing basis and schools will need to pay money to allow their teachers to essentially break copyright rules. So that's the current state of play around copyright. Now, what becomes really important is that you don't use material that's for other purposes other than explicitly teaching. Um, Another good example is just showing a film on the last day of school. That's clearly not going to be used for any real educational purposes and is a clear breach of copyright. Um, likewise, showing cartoons as sort of a, a laugh as during a presentation. Not a great idea, unless it's explicitly part of what you're teaching about and is an important, significant aspect of how you're teaching it, um, just including things for humor value is a breach of copyright. Okay. Now, an area associated with copyright is intellectual property. Now, essentially, as an employee, anything that you produce that's related to your duties as a teacher belong to your employer, to the school or the system. Um, now, this includes things that you may prepare on the weekends or on the holidays. As long as it's done in relation to your employment, um, you don't hold copyright to that, your employer does. Now, if you go and do something completely different, that's a different matter. But if you're doing it as part of an, um, an additional employment or source of income, you are meant to actually seek approval from your primary employer. Now, it's a little bit different if you're a part-time employee and um, or on contracts and so forth, but in the main, it's the ownership goes to the employer. Now, that's generally not enforced. 
Um, a number of employers have tried that on me over the years, and I've got a few techniques that have always made them back away from that quite rapidly. Um, and I'll share those with you in the tutorial. But essentially, it's, it's a very complex thing to um, take ownership of material. Uh, but given the fact that we're now moving into a much more digital age and a lot of resources could be replicated and used um, over time and used by other teachers and even other schools or even on sold, it's certainly very attractive to <coughs> excuse me, employers to look at commercializing those um, resources. Universities have long provided a specific exemption um, in university and enterprise bargains so that academics are not bound by intellectual property rules. Um, of course, universities want academics to freely publish and, and so forth. And to have a whole lot of rules such as that would limit academics' ability to work with textbook publishers, for example, and other processes of academic publishing. But that doesn't generally apply within the school systems. And even in universities, it's being challenged. Um, the idea that this recording, for example, could be used again next year, um, even if I moved on and went to another university. That's certainly a possibility now. And indeed, there's been a case where an academic has died and a student um, sort of looking up some details about their lecturer discovered he'd been dead for three years. Um, they'd been viewing these uh, presentations, thinking that he was alive and discussing things with him directly. Um, I can assure you that at least at the moment I'm alive. When you're reading this, I don't know. Um, so there's some challenges around intellectual property. In the main, however, as a teacher, um, you don't have ownership over the materials that you produce for your lessons. But we'll talk about that more in the tutorials, assuming I'm still alive. You do, however, still have moral rights. So the institutions shouldn't go and um, use your material without attributing it to you. Um, they shouldn't be changing it and modifying it and still having it attributed to you as something different and things of that nature. Now, these are not necessarily legal rights, but they are something that you can use to say, well, you need to still abide by these rules when you're using my material for other purposes. Now, privacy is a big issue, particularly in education Queensland schools, um, but it's going to be an increasing issue as more and more of our information is collected and stored online. And particularly around students, it's very important that we um, maintain their privacy however possible. Now that's a little bit difficult in some cases, particularly when we want to do say online discussions and uh, various other activities in that nature. But there are generally some fairly strict rules around the collection of data and of making data about students publicly available, um, or even just collecting it for your own purposes. Now this becomes a little bit tricky in digital technologies of course, we often teach about databases and developing websites and online forms and stuff and student projects where the students want to collect information, uh, maybe doing a survey about um, uh, garbage in the school, where, where garbage is being dropped and so forth, or how students are getting to and from school as a transportation study. And they'll often create a form or some sort of survey in order to collect data about that. Now it's important that they try to anonymize that as much as possible so that they're not collecting personal data about individuals um, as part of that process. So you not only have to make sure you abide by privacy rules, but you also need to make sure that your students abide by them when they're doing activities in relation to your classes. Now there's a big complex process of trying to identify um, how to use student information effectively. Of course, we want to collect information about students. 
and we want to do assessment and other things. So there are some legitimate reasons to collect information about students. But there's a whole lot of rules and regulations we have to abide by in doing so. And many, many different legal processes, um, the Education Act, the Public Service Act, um, what else we've got here, the Information Privacy Act. There's a whole range of things that you need to make sure that you're abiding by when you're collecting information. So essentially, this flowchart is developed for um, departmental schools and you can flow through that as to how and what information you can collect, what permissions you need to get in order to collect the data and who you can then share it with and how it can be stored and when it has to be destroyed and a whole lot of issues around that. So simple things such as an excursion form, which might seem very innocuous and things that we've done for many, many years in education, suddenly takes on a whole new perspective. If say we wanted to make it an online form and collect the names and phone numbers of parents, um, that may not be possible. We may have to go through other mechanisms. Um, and while the school may be able to store some of that data, you as a teacher may not be able to have access to, say, parental phone numbers and things of this nature. Um, now, it does cut the other way too, in that schools do take the privacy of teachers quite seriously. Again, particularly Education Queensland schools or departmental schools. And it's quite difficult to find out whether or not a particular person works in a school. Um, private schools tend to include lists of their teachers and publicize them and um, make promotion out of who their teachers are a lot more. But in Education Queensland, they are quite restrictive and they actually put a number of barriers in place to prevent parents from directly contacting teachers, mostly to protect the, the teacher's privacy and um, in some cases their safety. Uh, because there are some issues where some parents do get um, overwrought, uh, to put it mildly, and want to have direct conversations with teachers or direct access to teachers, that can be inappropriate. So another thing that we need to be aware of is around student consent. Now many of the things we want to do that are restricted can be still done if we gain the consent of the parents and the students, and sometimes the department, and almost certainly the school and the principal. Always run things past your department head or your school principal or your deputy, just so that you get someone else saying it's okay um, and it doesn't all fall upon yourself. That said, we can do a lot of things, almost anything within reason, um, if we get full consent of everyone involved. Now, generally this is seen as parental consent, but more and more, um, particularly internationally, the, there's a requirement to gain the student's consent as well. Um, now that of course is difficult with very young children that can't really give informed consent. But where possible, you should try to get the consent of both parents and of the students. Now of course, we need to be realistic about that. If we sought students' consent for everything, which potentially they have a right to have us do so, um, they may not consent to having to do that exam. Um, so there are some things that we override their rights on quite regularly in education. It's one of the issues in education. Um, we do actually abuse students' rights quite a lot. Uh, we restrict what they can do, where they can go, um, and so forth. But generally in society, that is seen as an acceptable evil um, simply to make the education systems work. Over time, that may change. Um, I suspect it will. But for the moment, we can still do quite a bit. Of course, we can no longer do any corporal punishment. Um, and any disciplinary processes, you really should make sure you're following the school's policies quite strongly. Of course, student rights are upheld quite vigorously by parents um, and the students themselves. So you do need to make sure you're well within the bounds of those aspects. But in general, if you wish to have students do something or use an online service and so forth, assuming it's not blocked, um, as long as you get the correct uh, consents, then you can generally do so. 
Finally, there's a few specific um, resources and repositories that you need to be aware of. The first is the Learning Place. This is for Education Queensland Schools, and it's their main internet um, dashboard or portal. It includes their learning management system, a number of databases and their website and so forth. And generally, it's a, a place where teachers and students can access um, course material and professional development activities and communication tools that are permitted within Education Queensland. Now, in the main, it's only got a small amount of information that's available publicly. So as a pre-service teacher, it can be somewhat challenging. If your teacher is using these resources extensively, sharing all of their materials and having students do activities and so forth within this environment, and you don't have access to it. So there are mechanisms whereby you can approach our, I believe it's the school secretaries, and get access to the learning place. And there are other approaches you can do within a school that you're on placement with to gain access, although that can take a little bit of time. So it's better if you think you're going to want to use those tools um, to get access beforehand. Now, the tools, while they are extensive, have not been massively um, utilized by teachers. Certainly during the pandemic, they were utilized a lot more, but in the main, probably less than 20% of teachers have been using that um, regularly beforehand, and that's been quite generous. Uh, they are looking at revamping the learning place and there'll be a new environment put in over the next few years, but that's a little way off yet. That's what the public facing website looks like. Um, and there are resources that you can get access to there, particularly if you're going on to placement in an Education Queensland school that you should go and have a look at and familiarize yourself with, including some of their policies. Another policy repository is the Queensland Curriculum and Assessment Authority, particularly on issues related to assessment. Now, traditionally, they've been focused on years 11 and 12, but more and more now they're focusing on all years of schooling. And the policies, again, particularly around assessment aspects, are detailed on, <coughs> excuse me, on the QCAA website. And finally, the federal government put in place a website a number of years ago now, probably about hmm, probably 10 years ago now, um, called My School. Now this takes all of the reported data that schools provide each year, including assessment data, and makes it available in a searchable format for parents to use, primarily to compare schools. So they can look at the schools within the catchment range of their homes and make decisions as to which school they want their child to attend. And it includes all the private and, and state schools and Catholic schools and so forth. And we're going to be using that during the tutorials. Um, it's also a great example of an online database and one that's generally accessible. Um, and it's also very useful for you as a pre-service teacher or when seeking employment in a school to find out details about that school. Um, beyond what they put on their public website, this will give you comparable data that you can um, look at and see how academic the school is, um, how many teachers in the schools have higher degrees, um, and a whole range of other data that's interesting as a teacher exploring whether or not to um, work or take a placement in that school, but also important to, for parents to be able to make decisions about those schools. So that's a look at the various policies that relate in particular to digital technologies. There are a lot more policies that are applicable um, and you'll learn those over time, but there's far too many to get a grip of straight away. I'll see you in the tutorials.